What's up fellow gamers, Freak here, and League of Legends patch 11.15 at time of recording was posted 14 hours ago. I had a very busy day technically yesterday, uh, but I did say I was going to do it, so here we go. We're going to run through it, and unlike the other ones, this probably will be pretty fast because it's it's roughly bedtime, but I want to get it done. Uh, okay, so 11.15 has nerfs to Gwen because of pro play. Um, her win rate uh, has been slowly climbing, but she is still comfortably sub-50 in every elo I've seen. Um, Annie doing too well in high skill win rate-wise. Wukong doing just generally too high win rate in most elos. Viego uh, mid-top nerf because of pro. Kale generally winning too many games in most elos. Um, Silas and Aurelia seemingly just having follow-up nerfs off of... Um, uh, Aurelia just getting nerfed off of uh, her first... Um, <clears throat> like off the 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 rework, the mini rework being too strong. Uh, Silas is being nerfed because of um, Riot going through and going for more systemic healing nerfs. Uh, so Silas, even though he is not really overperforming, um, they're doing a. It's going to be an overall nerf, but a nerf to W buff to Q because uh, of systemic healing changes. Uh, Thresh still too popular in pro. This will be like his fourth or fifth straight nerf. Um, and Aurelian Soul is really just winning way too many games in um, high plus elo, so sure. And then a bunch of buffs for champions who aren't doing very, very well, and a rumble adjustment because this was some script cleanup, a buff to Holebreaker, and a bunch of new skins. Okay, so uh, by the way, for those who are playing Rise of Sentinels, there's going to be a ton of extra uh, points coming through. This is going to be like roughly a 10x increase in points. Uh, so if you're having a hard time getting through your various city states, well, you're going to get through all of like the Act One and Act Two stuff um, in one or two games. Um, you just play one game, not even win one game. So yeah, you're gonna you're gonna pop through these really really fast. Uh, definitely, the tuning was pretty rough. I know for me, um, I'm still in the middle of Targon and haven't started Ionia, and I'm through like the first 15 or 16 stages of the battle pass. So clearly, these are like way out of line. Um, so good to see that change. Okay, great. Next up, Akshan is coming out. That's pretty cool. Champ Spotlight should be... I mean, probably by the time you watch this, the, the Spotlight might be out, but um, Champ looks pretty cool. Looks pretty fun. Okay, great. Uh, so here we go into our first set of nerfs. Annie uh, actually has a very, very, very high win rate. Um, one thing I actually went and looked at um, a couple of times over the last week or so was I just looked at my elo. I just looked at Platinum. I'm currently Platinum 2 as a jungler this season. Um, and just said, show me champions who are doing really well in each role uh, with at least 10,000 games played in that role um, and uh, over the last 30 days. So give me give me a whole big heaping of data to make sure that we're really, really like confident and, and you know, this, this win rate is reliable. Annie is a top performer in, in mid lane. She really is one of the strongest mid laners in the game for relatively high elo solo queue. This is just objectively true. Doesn't matter if you think she's popular or not. Doesn't matter if you think she's better or not. She's objectively winning a lot of games. It makes sense here. Okay, so um, anytime we have AP ratio nerfs, in the case it's 80% AP becomes 75% AP on the queue, uh, I just like to say, you know, roughly 15 AP per level is about right. I mean, this is what a Doran's ring um you know at level nine you're looking at what uh 135 which is mythic and adorns ring and runes somewhat reliably like it's it's not terribly far off um it, it's just a, a a basic rule of thumb that i think is you know fairly reasonable at guessing this kind of damage and as you can see yeah annie is down two to three percent damage on her primary damage ability now one thing to note um this actually won't change your skill order pretty much at all uh, but W max Annie has a far higher win rate than Q max Annie. Um, there could be matchup implications for the reasons why. It could be a counterpick thing, but um, W max Annie gives her really good wave clear, really good burst, um, and I couldn't tell you why that's the case, but the win rate is like two or three points higher than Q max, so um, probably going to be still very, very strong. Uh, Annie, I think this is a pretty small nerf, uh, under 1% win rate, um, and really if you want to gain just a bunch of MMR, you can just be an Annie main, and it'll work pretty well for you in a lot of matchups. Uh, next up is Aurelian Soul. Um, I know that the Aurelian Soul main on the um, gameplay team, uh, or at least, yeah, he like he actually really, really wants the E to be nerfed. Uh, really nerf Aurelian Soul's roaming because the roaming is so good, it means he can't be good elsewhere. Ultimately, um, there's still some degree of um, gut checking that goes on, though. Um, 
where like people are going to offer up a couple of different change lists. Like there's going to be a designer in charge in in charge of like okay, I have Aurelian Soul and Annie and Aureli this patch or whatever. Like I, I made those up. I've no idea if that's actually the link. Um, but they're going to come up with a couple of possible change lists that that hit the goals because they want to nerf by one percent usually. Like for example, uh, worth pointing out, right? Like this is a pretty small nerf. This is a pretty small nerf. Um, anytime that Riot is doing the sort of like automated nerfs of this champion is doing too well on a certain elo, they're not trying to bring them from like fifty three percent to fifty percent. They're just trying to take him like down below the oracle bound so like you know these nerfs are like this champion is op in solo queue they're just getting it like just below the bar of must be nerfed in solo queue and it's still going to be strong so if you're like oh this is an anti-meta pick it's still an anti-meta pick if it's good because you're good at the champion it's still very good like this is always going to be the case with these like you know low scope love tap nerfs because of the oracle which i think is actually very wise like i'm a fan of that approach um so uh anyway a couple options here right there is the the larger scope like there were some like pretty big updates to E in terms of like its movement speed and range and stuff. And um, the, the Q change here is just sort of what, what people thought was safer. And, and you know, obviously, if the designer was like, no, I really believe this is correct, I'm pretty sure they could have done that. Uh, but one second cooldown on Star Surge is pretty small. Um, worth noting that most players max Star Surge second. Um, so it doesn't really change anything. I mean, it kind of does, right? One second difference is one second difference, but, you know, seven becoming eight is, I would say, more meaningful than 11 becoming 12. Um, now it's worth noting that the correct Aurelian Soul skill order is W max into E max, um, putting points into E for better roaming, because not only does the range increase, but the movement speed of the, functionally a dash, um, increases as well, uh, making E max actually really, really, really reliable, because points in Q aren't actually that important um being better at roaming is getting back to mid lane sooner or getting to bot lane sooner that's more important um so by the way if you want free low um your 11 second cooldown becoming a 12 second cooldown is not going to change almost any of your fight statistics and you can just w max and e max and just win all of your games aurelian soul is probably the the hype train to ride if you want just a bunch of win rate this this is literally the hype train in league of legends right now if you want to win a bunch of games just play aurelian soul It'll take some practice. He's a tough champ to play, but he's really, 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 really strong. Um, okay, next up is Blitzcrank. Blitzcrank getting 3 armor and 20 damage on the Q. Of note, a 20% higher AP ratio. Keep in mind, Blitzcrank basically always goes Relic Shield, is my understanding. Um, it actually might be that he goes um, attack damage more quickly. One second, I'll pause, and I'll know in a second. And we're back. So pick rate is indeed people almost always go for the AP version of the item. But, and I'm actually going to just take 30 days of data to get an even larger sample. Uh, but the win rate, it shows that taking the attack damage one is better. So even though most people go Relic Shield, the win rate is about, and it's not a high number, but it's a large enough game that it's statistically significant. The win rate is 0.6% higher, roughly, if you go for Steel Shoulder Guards instead. Turns out three attack damage for the uppercut is worth more than, and I want to be clear about this one, um, you know, the, the the basic item of Relic Shield is 5 ability power, meaning this is 5 damage on your Rocket Grab. But if you land Rocket Grab, you are always getting an auto attack afterwards, and it's going to be the Punch, which deals double your auto attack damage, which means you're going to get 9 damage out of, you know, Rune Steel Spalders, versus getting 5 damage out of going Relic Shield. Yes, the ult can matter at some points, sure, whenever, but again, the win rates don't lie. Getting the attack damage one is actually better. Blitzcrank will be in auto attack scenarios often enough that it is the better item. It's worth noting that, like, even something this small, right, 5 AP versus 3 AD, and then as the item upgrades, you know, it's more AP versus more AD, um, but d d just this point is enough to give a six a 0.6% win rate difference. Uh, now, this could be biased by the fact that Blitzcrank players who know, know that AD is more important. Th this is a possible bias here. Um, but worth noting that, hey, uh, people are now more justified in going the seemingly improper choice of Relic Shield. By the way, this point to... Ability power increase means literally one more damage on Rocket Grab. Um, so, you know, instead of this being 75, uh, it's 96. Technically. Uh, anyway, here's the math on the character. I didn't actually do the Relic Shield math because it's not worth it. Um, so here's Blitzcrank's armor. Uh, the 3 armor change is a 2.2 to 1.5% physical durability increase. 100 armor at level 18 is cool. Uh, I will say this is a very, very large amount of armor. Uh, 40 is quite high. It means Blitzcrank tends to be anti-physical, uh, which means he's generally good into things like Pike um, and, and AD carries as opposed to mages, just because that's where his durability is skewed. It doesn't really matter. It's very easy for the designers to know like what a three armor 
change is going to give in terms of win rate. Um, it's actually why these uh, balance levers are used so often. Just like here's two AD, here's five move speed, here's three armor, here's four MR, here's whatever. Because there's a pretty large data set of like, this is how much it moves the winner to the champion. Um, which I think is chill, right? Like if your goals are to somewhat painlessly lower a win rate or raise a win rate by 1%, it's like, oh, well, I know three armor is 1% one, 1 win rate in, you know, 90% of cases. It's like, okay, chill, right? Um, so I think that that's reasonable. I think it's fine. Um, all right. Uh, and, and yeah, again, so 20x damage on rocket grab, you know, obviously it means more in the early game. Uh, that said, it's 20 damage. It's not the biggest thing in the world. It's kind of cool. I think at one point Rocket Grab used to do one to three hundred damage. It had been nerfed down a while ago when his earner was too high. This has been eased back up somewhat. Uh, the AP ratio is certainly getting up there. Um, of note, the, the win rate of Blitzcrank's actual first items. Um, Everfrost has a relatively low pick rate, uh, but it is his most common AP first item, and it's a solid one to two to two and a half percent lower win rate than any of the tank mythics. So I'm sure we will see an uptick in AP Blitzcrank. AP Blitzcrank is objectively, as far as I can tell, weaker than tank Blitzcrank, so... Uh, people are going to play bad builds more often. This will somewhat dampen the uh, actual effects of this fairly large buff on Blitzcrank. Um, he appears to be exactly balanced for Plat Plus. He'll be slightly strong now. Okay. Uh, next up is Caitlyn, and I think this buff is actually a very, very big deal. Worth noting, this builder Peacemaker, it is a total AD ratio, meaning it has um, base damage implications just by increasing the ratio, and I believe this buff is very, very big. Caitlyn is a little bit below balance, but not that bad, and I think this buff is very, very large. So this is just the pure base damage of the ability, as I said, um, right? You're getting 5% more damage out of the ability, and if you consider like a standard... Um, you know, 250 base damage ability, um, you're getting 12 and a half damage out of it, right? So, so you know, consider like Annie Q gaining 12 damage at rank five, like scaling from one from one to five. You know, it's it's you know two to three damage per rank. Like, that's an okay buff. Like that feels decent. You'd be like, okay, yeah, it's something. Um, but it keeps going, right? Like the buff becomes six percent at level 18, uh, which is you know not bad, but it keeps going from there, right? Not only is the base damage increased by, again, we're going to use Annie Q as our example, by 0 to 12, but the AP ratio is increased by more like 10%, uh, actually more like 15%, um, which is like, wait, that's that's really big. Like, that's buffing Annie Q's ratio from like 70, uh, you know, a 0.7 to like 0.8. It's like a, you know, this is like a 0.1 AP ratio and a 12 base damage buff on an ability. That's pretty high, right? In, in in similar terms, this is a pretty big deal. Again, so the base damage up by 2 to 6%, the ratio up by 2 to, I mean, realistically, more like 15%. Again, we're using, you know, pseudo attack damage. Um, you know, if you have uh, 10 more AD level 1 and 2, it doesn't change anything because the, the um, AD ratio is still 1.3 in both cases. But yeah, from level 3 and realistically level 4, but whatever onwards, you know, it goes up and up and up and up. So uh, pretty big buff here to Caitlyn. She's objectively, I think, going to be on the strong side. Um, definitely worth playing. Should be in a good spot. Next up is Cassiopeia, getting a flat 10 damage added to her E. Uh, Cassiopeia's E is uh, one of uh, a few abilities where it has two base damages. It has the uh, rank up damage that you're seeing here, um, which is only accessed if they're currently poisoned via your Q or W, or I believe other champions poisoned as well. Um, you get this extra damage on top, but also Cassiopeia's E has like 50 plus 4 per level base damage, whether they're poisoned or not, that goes on top. So here are the numbers. I think it's 52 um, plus 4 per level. Uh, and here you go. So... Because you can only get this damage through them being poisoned, it, you always must round in all of the rest of the damage, and here you go. Um, obviously, you actually can't get this damage at level 1 because you can't poison them and hit them with the E, but from here onwards, we're looking at 15 to 5% uh, damage increase. Now, again, this is base damage, um, so you know the more ability power you have, the less this sort of matters. Obviously, the more you level up, the less it matters, but this is an early game buff to Cassiopeia. Um, from what I have seen, Cassiopeia is doing reasonably well in solo queue. Uh, she is a, a viable mage option. Uh, but she is not really played in pro. Uh, pro tends to be really early game focused. Uh, there is a chance we see Cassiopeia show back up in pro. Like basically, I'm of the opinion that Cassiopeia is probably viable right now, or at least after this patch, is going to be viable in pro play. Whether a team picks her up or not is up for debate. I hearken back to the Ziggs buffs from 11.12 or 13, where I said very firmly, I think Ziggs is just the best bot laner in the game. He should be seen in pro, but we probably won't see it. Um... He is now a meta bot laner, but it took over a month. Um, now, Ziggs is in a stronger state um, than Cassiopeia is going to be. But Cassiopeia is playable. 
strong, worth playing. I think she suits the metagame. The, the ranges that other champions play at suit her quite well. She likes fighting melee champions. Miasma is very, very good against a lot of things like Lee Sin. You actually break half his kit um, with that ability. Uh, there's a lot here that can work really, really well. Um, Caspia tends to lose to high-ranged comps. There aren't a lot of high-ranged comps. Varus is frequently banned, and, and so on and so forth. Cassiopeia, I think this is a good metagame for her. She is powerful. She should be played. We'll see if teams want to go for her. As we've seen with things like Ziggs, teams are often very slow at doing this. Next up is, oh, uh, yeah. Next up is Gwen. Uh, Gwen is taking a pro focus nerf. This is the ability you max second, and they are reducing the rank one through four power of the ability, which means level 13, she's the same champion, but didn't get to have the same power in the first few levels, which means she's going to have less gold in this, even in late game, be a weaker champion because of having less gold income from having uh, worse fights. So here is her actual attack speed. Um, using her base stats and her E rank up uh, as the inputs here and there you go 14 percent less auto attack dps basically for the first you know large number of levels in the game and then okay it softens up at eight not uh at eight at ten at eleven at uh, or eight, eight ten twelve thirteen there you go those are the, the the rank second max levels okay yeah pretty meaningful nerf right um 14 14 less auto attack dps this is truly really, you know dps right sure a lot of times she's gonna like e auto q and then just like walk away it's like well i autoed once i got the reset who cares yeah, that's still going to be part of the pattern, and and now it's even more that way. But uh, now your ability to fight back against her is pretty meaningful. Um, I, th I think this will be felt, you know, when she's battling things like Camille and Jax, which, by the way, are still the good matchups into Gwen, as far as I can tell. Um, she does not work well against fighters who just want to fight her in her face. This actually further exacerbates that weakness, which I think is actually pretty reasonable. Um, I think... Um, I think one frustration point I have seen from players is that they feel like new champions um, don't have such pronounced weaknesses as older champions do, often because their kits, you know, like Gwen's E gives her a dash and bonus range and bonus move speed. It really does three things. Okay, I mean, Vayne's Tumble does two, arguably. Like, yeah, Vayne's Tumble does two. You know, Silver Bolts does one thing. Um, Condemn does... I mean, I guess it's damage plus a knockback plus possibly a stun, kind of three things. Like, you know, it depends on how you want to grade all these things. But yeah, okay, new champion's abilities are fairly complex. And this means in a lot of cases that as you learn the champion, you get good at them. You've got a lot of different tools for different situations. And, you know, if you compare to, let's say, Lux, it's like, well, I throw out a skill shot that, that roots and damages. To be fair, it, it roots, it damages, it preps the passive, you know, like technically it kind of does several things. But like um, the, the point stands, I think, reasonably reliably that like, okay, new champions seem to be a bit more well-rounded in some cases. Um, so I'm a fan of saying, hey, Gwen is actually not a good auto attack trader in the early game. And truly, she isn't compared to any other meaningful auto attack trader. Um, like Jax's passive attack speed is just better than Gwen's E attack speed. It's just like, this is like factually true um, for the first eight levels of the game. It's just like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's truly just better. Jax's passive is better than her rank, like her actual ability. Now, of course, again, her ability has a dash, it gives her bonus range, like there's things there. But anyway, the point is to say, um, going harder on the weakness, not only a weak, uh, you know, weakening early game, which is pro folks, which is good, but she really is not going to win auto attack trades against Jax and Camille and Riven, um, also good. And, and so I like the, the, angle here. Uh, next up is Aureli, who's just doing too well overall. Um, this is one where I did um, uh, fail to put numbers down. Uh, apologies for this one. Um, ultimately, uh, W is being maxed second. So, um, and, and this is once again, by the way, an ability with a total AD ratio, uh, but also a base damage. And the base damage, of course, goes up with putting points into it. So uh, for the first seven levels of the game, it's just the one point wonder for there. Uh, it's obviously a... 20% damage increase from the AD ratio, or decrease. Um, and the base damage is like 10, I think. So you're looking at, um, you know, looking at, at the uncharged version's ability, you're looking at 30 from the AD and 10 from the base damage, if I have my numbers right, um, you know, which is, uh, so So we're going from, what, 40 damage to 35 or something. Like, it's, it's more like a 12% damage decrease or something. Uh, it's something around there. Um, it, this is not trivial. Um, this is going to matter. This is going to be a fairly meaningful damage decrease. Uh, in this case, we're seeing the damage uh, mitigation go from 40 80 to 40 70. Um, so you're going to feel this as soon as you're level two. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much as soon as you learn to fight dance, because I don't believe you learn to fight dance at one in any situation. Um, so it's weaker at functionally all points in the in time. A bit of a late game nerf. Um, Irelia, after the changes, appeared to be slightly low elo skewed. 
um, went from being very high elo skewed to being somewhat low elo skewed. So I actually like that they are mostly actually tapping down late game. Um, you know, damage reduction in late game is is the, the big nerf here, right? That's what you're going to feel a lot more of. Um, 80% damage reduction to 70% damage reduction is an increase of 50% more damage taken. Because instead of taking 20, you're taking 30. So you are taking 50% more damage uh, while channeling W at level 18. Like, that is a really, really big deal. It means less for the magic uh, reduction here, but um, that's still going to be there to some degree. Um, so, yeah, you know, this 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 can be somewhat hefty. It certainly will, uh, you know, clamp down late game Aurelia somewhat. I think she's still going to be very strong, worth playing in solo queue, worth playing in pro. Uh, next up is Kale. Kale's just overall way too high win rate. Um, she is breaking all kinds of barriers in mid lane especially. Um, and yeah, it doesn't seem to be bullied quite as hard by mages who can't quite as successfully all in, um, when, you know, compared to playing against, um, as dumb as it sounds, like Malphite top is actually really tough here for Kale because he Q spams and you don't have the sustain to stay alive in that lane. Um, you know, getting jumped on by a Jax is pretty impossible to deal with. Um, whereas Syndra feels like you can play around her more. Like if she's cheating up on you, now she's in a gankable spot. Um, uh, so, you know, Kale appears to be doing better in mid lane. Uh, so a 4 MR nerf is generally going to affect her mid lane matchups more than her top lane matchups. Again, uh, counter matchups like Kale into Malphite, which appears to be very Malphite favored. Um, it just gets worse because here's some more magic damage going at you. Have fun with that one. Um, but yeah, the, the option is to say, okay, Kale's slightly less good in mid. Um, again, she is still an outstanding pick overall in solo queue. Take your L's for a while. Um, here's your durability matrix, 3.1% um, 3, 3 to 2.9% less durability. Uh, again, I, I've brought it up several times, but basically nerfing MR is, is functionally a flat nerf at kind of all points in time. Um, if you really wanted, you could like, you know, here's what it is when you level up or, uh, you know, when you when you take a stat shard and it's like, oh, look, it's still 2.9 to 2.7. Like, again, the numbers barely change, even if you use stat shards. Uh, so... Yeah, uh, about 3% more damage taken. That's the math anytime you um, hit MR by 4 on almost any champion in League of Legends. So there you go. That's that's going on there. Um, yeah, nominal nerf, but again, still very, very strong. Very much worth playing, especially if you know what your matchup is. Next up is Kennen. This is actually a pretty meaningful buff here. So Kennen um, has definitely been out of sight for a while. They're not getting played almost anywhere. Uh, so he's getting uh, 10 to 30 damage on Q. Um, I will say, you know, Kennen is, you know, one of the... Is he actually maybe the very first energy champion? I'm not sure. Because um, I think he predates Lee Sin. Uh, but he was in the original, you know, Ninja Triumph, right? Where uh, we had, like, Kennen, Akali, Garen in the middle, and then uh, Shen in, in some order. I think Akali might have been the last one. Uh, but I remember Shen and Kennen were the first two. I just forget if Kennen was the first one. Um, either way, um, I actually think his kit holds up in terms of using energy in a fair way. Uh, where like he he can't use energy to reliably hit you in in any way at all. He like has to go for like the the, the fourth stack auto attack and then hit W active. He has to like run into melee range uses E or he has to land a skill shot with Q. All of these are to some degree quite fair. Um, and uh, you know compared to like a Kali into melee matches where it's like oh no she just hits Q on me. Um, which you know again she's melee she gets to do different things it's it's kind of whatever. Uh, but yeah I think Kennen's Q is a very very fair spell. It, I think it's the poster child for like what makes sense as an energy spell. It is a skill shot that is blocked by minions and doesn't pass through a single thing. Um, so despite it being infinite, uh, you can play around it by just always putting minions between you and him. It feels pretty good. Uh, so yeah very very large buff here. Uh, but again this is his most interesting and also least reliable tool. Makes it a cool buff. Uh, again, 10 to 30 base damage and a 5% higher AP ratio. So here we go. Uh, Kennen's Q damage is up pretty uh, pretty nicely. It is a pretty much a flat 3% or 13% damage increase. I added the decimal because anytime it rounds to the same number, I like to show the decimal. So there's at least one digit that changes. Um, and then if we do the same assumption of uh, 15 AP per level that we kind of just make up for all of our mages, um, you know, Doran's Ring, etc., uh, the, the buff is slightly less strong because the AP ratio buff isn't as good as the base damage buff. Uh, that said, that's fine. Um, like that, that's okay. Uh, you know, you're still getting a buff here. That's still nice. Um, it's, you know, what, one fifteenth, it's 7% more, more AP ratio roughly. Uh, but yeah, still feels pretty good. This is, this is pretty solid. Um, definitely some meaningful damage here. It should be a pretty reasonable win rate gain. Uh, anytime you can land a stun, you know, you get in with your rocket belt and your ulti zaps into the queue for like 50 more damage. It's going to feel pretty good. Uh, next up is Mordekaiser. Mordekaiser getting two seconds off his W cooldown, and he's going to store much more shielding from damage he's dealt. Uh, keep in mind, damage dealt to non-champions is cut to one quarter. Um, but here you go. Here's the cooldown. Uh, it is what you definitively max last for sure. 
Um, and indeed, you just keep your two seconds cooldown here. But yeah, late game 10 becoming 8 is uh, quite meaningful. I don't believe that this is the kind of thing that's going to make you suddenly max W second. I don't believe the numbers are there in any way at all. Uh, but hey, it exists. Cool, whatever. Um, on this side of the map, we get um, uh, the, the damage amp. Obviously, the percentages are identical. Uh, so this column is going to move. It's going to be 78% at all points in time. But I felt, hey, it was kind of interesting to say, hey, by the way, uh, the W, like, shield cap is always a percentage of Mordekaiser's max HP, and then, okay, it's a percentage of damage dealt, so we can just do some very easy math to say how much damage do you have to deal to champions to fully charge your shield? Um, and we go to having to do about 500, having to do about 400. Um, obviously, you're not learning W at level 1, so you're looking more, you know, here, maybe, for actually learning W. Um, and, yeah, okay, cool. Obviously, it takes 22% less damage to, to cap it. Um, but, you know, you can kind of see here, like, oh, okay, you know, do these numbers feel easier to reach in terms of, you know, maxing your shield and popping W and surviving a team fight? Yeah, totally doable. So, that was kind of interesting. There you go. Um, just putting some numbers down because I think they're kind of interesting. So, now you know. Uh, next up is Nidalee. Uh, Nidalee has had really, really atrocious win rate for a while. Um, I think for uh, several years um, because she's always been really high elo bound. Uh, I am always glad to see base stats on melee champions become reasonable for melee champions. Uh, one thing I have seen, though, is, okay, Riot is more and more being willing to um, really heavily nerf MR below 30, which I don't think is really a problem. Um, but I think we are, or I say we, I'm not doing any of this. Um, Riot is definitely power creeping the hell out of health per level. Um, this is, like, definitively risen by a ton. Um I remember back when Runes Reforged came out, uh, champions were compensated for um, the runes taken away, which I think makes total sense. That was fine. Uh, and so it meant mages got health per level instead of... Uh, they just got like a shit ton of extra health per level um, instead of using seals. Um, and I believe those were compensated pretty much one for one. Uh, that they all just got 12 health per level, I think was the number. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the number that they all got, and they went on from there. Um and sometimes they didn't get that, but now, like, mages all have, like, 2200 health at level 18, which, again, is sort of, they had that anyway because they used runes, and, and, you know, that's not really any different. Like, it's, you know, sort of reasonable, like, the game was played in that way, so let's just keep the game played that way. It, you know, makes some sense there. Um, but, you know, now it's like, okay, well, now all the other champions who weren't running health per level are now just getting health per level. Uh, even though they got their other compensations somewhere else down the line in Runes Reforged. It just means like champions based stats are power creeping really, really hard, um, which at a certain point needs to happen uh, because other things are getting better. So for example, um, fighter atomization in 2021 is light years better than it was in 2013. Like go back and look at the items you could buy in 2013. Like go watch Worlds games from 2012 or 2013, and like look at the stuff that like Nidalee and Jax and Shen got to buy, um, and now like what they get to buy. When it was like, oh wow, there are actually items built for fighters. Like these exist now. Um, there are actually items built for assassins. Like I remember doing things like um, the Vagar and Gangplank champion spotlights from way, way back when. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm going to build Nashor's Tooth on Vagar because where the hell else am I going to get 20% cooldown reduction? Now he has Cosmic Drive. It's like, well, if you want to see that, you had to go Frozen Heart. Why would Vagar want Frozen Heart for literally anything but the CDR stat or Nashor's Tooth? He doesn't want to auto attack that much either, so like that also feels bad. But it's Frozen Heart or Nashor's Tooth because you need CDR, and the same was true for Gangplank because well, you need CDR somewhere, so you just build a Frozen Heart, even though you don't want to. But well, the other options didn't exist, so too bad. Um, and now they have real items like oh, well, a whole class damage just got more powerful, and now fighters can actually frontline while dealing damage because now Renekton's build isn't Brutalizer into full tank because there are actually no other options. Okay, well, now Renekton actually has 350 AD in a full build. Before, he had 137 because he had Brutalizer and a full tank build. It's like, well, no one's got to be tanky because Renekton just doesn't do any damage to the late game anymore. It's like, well, it turns out when champions get real items, well, they get power crept because their itemization exists. Um, and lo and behold, now champions have to be tankier to handle the fact that, like, well, fighters are good now. Um, this changes class balance around. It's gonna, it could be a pretty long ramble. We're going to stop the point now. But the um, point is, okay. Nidalee is next in a long load of champions, uh, getting a lot more health. Um, I am pretty confident if you just took, um, you know, the the mean level 1 and 18 health of a champion, even accounting for runes, um, every year, uh, over the last five years, it would probably steadily increase. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem, because itemization is getting better and better, but, you know, just another 
Another dot on the graph, that's all. Anyway, Nidalee's getting a lot of extra health. 5% more health level 1, 10% more health at level 18. Uh, so it is a late game focused buff, which means it is a um, low to mid elo skewed buff as well, which is totally fine, uh, worth doing. Um, 25 health certainly can affect jungle clear if it was really, really tough and you were like almost dying to Gromp. Cool. You could survive one more auto hack against Gromp sometimes. Obviously when you like go and then fight for Scuttle, you know, that battle might go better as well. Like certainly this, this is going to matter, absolutely. Um, just, you know, not an absolute ton. It's going to mean less than jungle than it will in, like, top lane. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, it's kind of amazing that Nidalee, a functionally melee champion, like, she can't really stay fighting in ranged form. Like, she's going to throw a javelin, but then, like, she actually has to jump into melee range to do anything. And it's like, oh, she gets real melee champion health now, finally. Cool. Like, we, she can have low armor. Like, that that can be fine. Um, and she probably does. I don't actually know what the, what the numbers are. But um, yeah, this this health total is quite low. Um, and now it's, or was, and now it's like, oh, it's, like, this feels relatively modern for a melee champion. I mean, 95 per level is on the high side for sure. Uh, melee champions tend to average around 90, I would say. Um, the ranger about 85. Um, so, cool, yeah, she's on the high side, but, like, that's okay. She has to dive in and doesn't have any self peeling tools, really. She has zero crowd control. Um, and, yeah, she can dash, but... I think it's a pretty cool buff. So, should gain some win rate. Probably still going to be underpowered for most people, but cool to see the buff regardless. Um, Rel is getting a reset, uh, a revert on her W nerf from a long while ago. Um, switching forms with W is definitely the really, really big thing with Rel. Uh, the uptime and downtime here matter quite a bit. Um, and yeah, she's not doing exceptionally well, so cool. Here's some buffs. She's, you know, um, we can solo queue for sure. Uh, next up is Rumble. Uh, this is mostly a scripting update. Um, this is one of the things where I talked about... Um, Designers coming in and asking for opinions and stuff and posting things up. Uh, so the tooltip for Drumble Passive always said six seconds. Um, but through the magic of how the game is coded or was coded and how he was coded way back when, to be fair, Rumble's like a champion for like 2012 or something. Um, it hasn't really been touched much since. Um, the actual overheat duration uh, was incredibly variant. Uh, my understanding was it was like actually between like 4.75 and six seconds. It was like really, 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 really variant. Um, and, you know, again, the, the median number or the mean number, I forget which, but whatever, it, it was set at 5.25. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to update functionality to like match the tooltip at six. And I and some other people were like, we should definitely keep it to like what it actually is in game. If the average is 5.25, just like, just change the tooltip. Like I'm glad we're cleaning it up. So it's not like a really high variance number, but like he's played at 5.25, just update the tooltip. Like he clearly functions in that way. So I just let him function that way. Um, so I, I and those other people prevailed in that opinion. So it is it is a tooltip update, and also the actual variance is, is clamped down. Um, you know, other little minor stuff like the uh, heat resetting on undoing. Um, the heat decay is now actually fixed at four seconds as well. Um, no bonus spells on hitting 100 heat. This is actually a, a real nerf and is going to matter. Um, like... Obviously, you could, you know, skill check with Rumble, but I noticed, like, I used to play a lot of Rumble uh, in, like, 2013, 14, 15, around then, um, and I always noticed that, like, I would have to wait, like, I would W at 30 to get to 50, and then have to wait to press Q or E because I wouldn't be overheated yet. I wouldn't I wouldn't be in, in the, the heat zone. Um, and, and so, like, okay, well, I have to wait to press my button to get the damage because um, the way it felt like the ability was coded... Uh, or the password code was like, okay, it's going to check every quarter second or half second for what is my heat gauge. Okay, my heat gauge is 50. Okay, you're now in the status of being heated. Um, instead of doing things like, you know, checking your heat when you cast the spell and making sure it's the empowered version um, and things like that. And like, I could demonstrate that this was true with things like using Q to overheat and then dubbing for move speed. I would like, I would not get the good move speed. I'd have to wait, let the bar go to 50, then turn yellow, then I could hit W. Um, so, uh, you know, these are all kinds of things that I think are going to be, um, appropriately updating. And, and now you, again, you can't also cheat out spells and whatnot. Um, and obviously you couldn't cheat the other way because you just go down to zero, right? So it, like checking heat appropriately at 50 is only a buff, but obviously not getting to jam a second spell out at hundred is obviously a nerf. So there you go. Um, overall going to be a nerf to rumble. Um, okay. And then, um, Electro Harpoon basically, uh, the way this is coded under the hood, um, your basically the spells and it's functionally your client 
Like, the spell has a range of, it was 10,000, now it's 25,000, which is basically the entire map. Um, but the actual spell itself, the spell's logic, is what tells it the actual range of the projectile. Um, so this is this is how your client knows, oh, I walk up to cast here, um, versus I just cast in the direction as though I'm casting, you know, 18,000 units, you know, towards mid lane. Um, the spell itself handles, okay, I've went 1,100 units, I, I now destroy myself and, and I stop flying. Um, so this is, you know, by the way, this is how that's coded under the hood. Um, cool beads. Next up is Shivana. Um, so Shivana, for the last several years, um, people have uh, played AP Shivana more than Bruiser Shivana. Um, people have believed AP Shivana was a stronger build. This has, to my recollection, never been true across several, several years. I know every time we see Shivana in the patch notes, I say the same thing, and I'll say it again because I looked recently for this. This is still true, by the way, that Shivana's Bruiser, Bruiser items are higher win rate than her AP first items. Um, and so here are some buffs to Shivana Q. Uh, now, Shivana Q rank up does have an AD ratio rank up incentive. Uh, now the rank up incentive has been diminished uh, because the cooldown is front loaded. Um, that said, no matter what, this is, you know, nine seconds becoming seven is a uh, very nice clear speed buff. Keep in mind, Shivana Q has a cooldown reset mechanic. Landing auto attacks lowers your Q cooldown. Um, so, you know, this is more like um, five becomes three than nine becomes seven. Uh, in some cases, this is like a percentage-wise an even bigger buff. Uh, but otherwise, there are just some AP ratio buffs. Um, I don't think the first hit, second hit stuff matters. It's mostly flavor, to be fair, because they hit almost identically. Um, you know, when you use AD Shivana, the first hit of Q, uh, like they both have like some flat bonus damage on top, but the first hit of Q has 100% your total AD, and then the second hit is like 20 to 80% of your total AD. So it's like, ah, my second, my second hand, you know, does more and more damage the more it ranks up. Um, which is like, okay, sure. But it's still just like, here's an auto attack, it deals this damage. It applies on hits twice, so that's kind of cool. But like, it's just like, it's just one ability, basically. Um, it's just one hit of damage functionally, it just applies it on hits twice. Um, so it goes from basically being a 0.4 AP ratio to a 0.6 AP ratio. That is obviously pretty big. It is a 50% increase to the AP ratio. Um, obviously, in most cases, you've got Nashor's Tooth, which is, I think, 15% on each side. So it's really... Um, 0.7 becomes 0.9, if I have that right. Um, either way, here is Shivana's Q cooldown, again, before and after. It is something you max last. I think even with AD Shivana, it is correct to do so. Um, and then as far as um, having 15 AP per level, um, again, it rounds in her total AD. So you can see, bam, when you hit level 14 and you rank up the, the ability, you're getting a, a pretty fat um, damage increase here. Uh, but the AP ratio increase is pretty meaningful, and up, up, up it goes. Um, and as you get more AP, yeah, you get more damage, and it feels good. So, cool. Shivana, um, pretty meaningful extra damage. I think this is a very good buff to put in, by the way. Uh, this is this is kind of the weird thing, right? Because uh, one of the things with alternate builds, right, in AP Shivana versus AD Shivana, our alternate builds, is they want to play differently. Um, it's one of the weird things about trying to make AP and AD KL feel different, because at the end of the day, they just auto-attack and press their buttons, and all of her spells, except her W, have AP and AD ratios, so how different are they really? Um... There's some, but not much, right? Um, with Shivana, it kind of passes the test of like, well, AP Shivana clearly plays very differently than AD Shivana. She's a fireball mage. Um, the problem with AP Shivana is she has exactly one button, right? She has dragon form E and kind of nothing else. She doesn't want to sit in melee range because her build is like Night Harvester, Dark Harvest, Nasher's Tooth, or Lich Bane, or whatever. And yeah, maybe you auto once in a blue moon, but like you really don't care. You're probably actually Cosmic Drive second or something. Um, either way, like, you know, you're, you're really not playing in melee very much because you you don't have that much damage or that much durability, I should say. Uh, but so, so like, so that's not a very healthy play style, right? Having one button is not, not a great champion. So it's like, okay, well, let's make your Q feel better because W already has an AP ratio. Let's make your Q matter. So like, can we get AP Shivana to engage with more of her kit? And buffing the AP ratio of one of your abilities by 50% is a lot that is a lot, and with the cooldown going down really severely, um, that's a lot, a lot. Um, and considering, you know, the AP ratio is going to be used more often, especially while clearing the jungle, or killing Dragon, or Baron, or Herald, or whatever, um, you're going to feed that in as well. But yeah, okay, AP Shivana can be buffed because it is the weaker of the two builds, and hey, let's give it some more gameplay by making it more auto-attack reliant, which is also a positive thing. Um, yeah, sure, it runs the risk of, like, conversion the builds into kind of the same gameplay, but at the end of the day, people will want to play AP Shivana. Let's actually give that a rich gameplay experience, which I think is better than, like, preserving the difference in play styles. 
Um, so fan of the design direction of these buffs, and yeah, pretty, you know, not huge. Again, she has to auto-attack the Axis, but it is still a buff to AP Shivana. Um, and again, a buff to AD Shivana because of the cooldown change. Uh, even AD Shivana maxes at last. Silas is getting less healing by a pretty substantial amount. The AP ratio going from 45 to 40, and the damage going down by 5 to 25. Um, it can double when he's at low health, okay, whatever. But as Recompense Chain Lash's second half damage goes up by 10 flat and a 0.1 AP ratio. So here is Silas's Q damage, assuming you get both halves. Base damage is not up by much, but he maxes it last. So hey, 100 becomes 110 is not garbage. Uh, the AP ratio difference, of course, also quite meaningful. Um, this is more than a 10% damage increase, um, right? Because it's it's a 12.5% damage increase. So I'm not sure why this isn't... Oh, it's... Oh, right. It is not a 10% damage increase because there's a front half ratio as well. The total ratio goes from 1.2 to 1.3. Um, despite, you know, this being 10% higher, this is more like um 8% higher i think so uh technically the more ability power you get obviously the more ranks you get it is uh, a lesser of a buff um so okay some early game wave clear power if you can land the stun your q does more damage okay great um so obviously just overall more offense to silas um the fact that he can access this um even with the ability he maxes last i think is correct as a as a compensatory buff um it is a really of course high damage ability but whatever um, and then as far as Kingslayer is concerned, okay, a pretty substantially less healing, and here you go. This is just the base damage, uh, the base value down by 17%. Um, the ratio is not quite so severe. It trends towards 14% um, less healing, but like pretty substantially less healing on Silas. Uh, next up, is, and this should be just a nerf overall. Uh, next up is Syndra. Uh, Syndra is getting some buffs to show back up in the meta because of course she is. Um, Syndra is a champion with, um, I believe, incredibly high base mana. Uh, no, let me let me think that through. Um, my recollection, that doesn't matter. I think she has like reasonable base mana and very high mana scaling. It doesn't really matter. Um, anyway, that's she is, um, you know, getting a revert to a nerf from a year ago. Almost exactly a year ago. Uh, go back to having cheap Q costs early on in the game, which means she has really, really good early wave control, early push, a lot of lane priority. Um, in general, this will do a lot to bring Syndra back into the pro meta. We will probably see Syndra in pro as a result. Just pretty much full stop um cool beads i think it's correct by the way for dark spheres mana cost to not scale so heavily um whatever moving on uh thresh e cooldown is now being increased by two to one second so thresh is a really interesting champion is the only one i have seen where the most common skill order right q into w into e or vice versa or whatever um is under 40% pick rate. Um, Thresh has a lot of different skill orders. He is the only champion I know of with extreme skill order variation. I think that is super cool and really, really interesting. Um, I am a huge fan of that. I think that is really, really neat. You can pick a champion and decide, oh, this is a shield max game versus a hook max game. Um, and then is it shield max, hook max second, etc.? That's really compelling. Now, the only thing he never maxes first, and win rates also show that's not correct, is E max first. I think it's going to change, but it's okay, by the way. He's probably not going to go E max first. Um, but also, it is it has been shown through win rate and pick rate data that Q and W first and second um, are also pretty substantially the better builds. Now, I actually would have been game for 13 to 9 being the nerf. Um, because again, Thresh is maxing E last. Why do you need 0.25 seconds cut off the timer for the ability that you're leaving as a 1.1 or to level 14, which you're not getting on Thresh anyway? You could on 13 to 9, it would have been totally reasonable. Whatever, it's not a huge problem, but like, again, I think you can almost always get away with clean numbers. Um, at worst, halves when you're like, oh, the cooldown changes from 3 to 2. Okay, yeah, like, maybe it should just be 2.5 flat, but we don't want, I don't want to go to this, 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 this too much. Anyway, um... Okay, two to one second shorter or longer on the cooldown. Again, E is almost always maxed last in all orders, but hey, in case we're maxing it second, because I believe the most common build is Q into E, uh, but it's not his best build is Q into E. Either way, it doesn't matter if we're doing it second, just like consider these numbers are down here at, at 13 plus instead. You know, 18% longer in the early game, 11% longer in the late game. Uh, again, you're, you're often not reaching these levels anyway, so, you know, pretend it stops here. Um, yeah, moderate nerf, two seconds off the flay cooldown. We're going to keep, you know, giving Thresh some small nerfs over and over and over and over and over again. Um, 
cool, great. He's still going to be pretty good, as far as I can tell. Next up, Viego is getting some uh, reasonably meaningful nerfs to his laning power. Um, his actual uh, sort of overall pick rate and play rate uh, went up since the most recent nerfs because, of course, the uh, Shroud was strictly buffed. So even though he had uh, less lane sustain, he has more power through his like move speed and, and the Shroud like functioning better and whatnot. Um, and so he's like objectively better as a jungler. And he's not even that much worse as a mid laner because he has a better Shroud, even though he has less sustain. Um, so they're just going harder on sustain. Now, I know 10% seems like a um, really, really trivial number. Um, this is here because the designer said they still want this to be a potential tuning lever. That like, hey, maybe they don't want him as a 42%, but as a 47% win rate mid laner. So they can like raises back up to like 15 or 20 or 25 or something and is like have the number be there i am personally still a very big fan of like these sort of like vestigial um hey but it does x to minions but it does y to monsters but it does z to, to epic monsters because um you can hide them behind holding shift in the tooltip um you can get functional power and and realistically like when you queue a minion wave and you see it doesn't do very much damage or you don't heal very much you're just like oh okay i get it like it, it's i don't think you hurt very much um, I think you get a lot of wins and very little pain, and every design choice you ever make is always going to have pros and cons. Um, like it, they are all decisions; they are almost never no-brain choices. I think these are, this is one of the better choices you can make: is have these vestigial, you know, X to minions, Y to monsters, whatever. I think I think these are actually reasonably elegant um, because they, yeah, I think this is, they're they're quite elegant and and they serve the purpose they're meant to serve without a lot of extra baggage, which is good. Um, you know, consider the difference of like ah. We make him a weaker jungler by nerfing his base armor. It's like, well, good luck keeping the laning phase balanced with three less armor. Right? Makes sense. Okay, anyway, uh, this ability deals 10 less base damage, but does 10 more base damage to monsters. So PvP power is down, wave clear power is down, poke power is down, monster damage is identical. But again, healing from minions is cut by... 80%. Now, again, in terms of raw numerical health gain, this is actually a lesser nerf than the previous one. It was cut from 100% to 50%. Um, you know, percentage to percentage, yeah, okay, it's, you know, cut by 80%, but in terms of, like, raw health gained, it's actually a lesser nerf. But, again, raw PvP power is down. This will hurt Jungle Viego just as much as it hurts Lane Viego, and obviously in some cases more because the wave clear matters a lot, but um, this will hurt Jungle Viego some. Um, this will hurt um, Lane Viego somewhat more. Um, of note, uh, Q has a 60% total AD ratio attached, uh, so that's why the damage is higher than it might look. Um, just by the way, here you go. Uh, so, so the poke damage is not actually quite as bad as it might look. Obviously, the more attack damage he builds, the better this looks. Um, I think Viego needs further retouching. Um, he needs better crit ratios. Uh, like So for example, his um, Q damage, I think, um, scales up to, I think, 75% more damage based on his critical strike chance. This could be supercharged. Um, I don't know if it looks up his critical strike damage or not for things like Infinity Edge. Um, but basically, his best build is definitively Divine Sunderer, um, which feels like a pretty big flavor loss. Um, I think Viego building Bruiser is somewhat unhealthy as the reset champion. I think it's a problem when that was happening with Echo. I think it's a current problem with Katarina. Um, I think it is a problem with Viego for any of these sort of reset champions, um, you know, staying for a long time, then haha, I get out anyway, or I heal back up or whatever. Like, these kits are only, I think, healthy kits when there's risk of not resetting and, and getting zero. Um, I think there needs to be much more inherent risk for a resetting kit to do well. I know Echo's not really a reset. That one's a little bit different. The ult is meant to be a lot of safety. Um, but the tension of can I hit R in time is a meaningful bit of tension. Just ask Jensen. Um, but, you know, if his build is Divine Sunderer, Sterix Gage, Randuin's Omen every game, I think there is a very big flavor fail of Viego, who is like, you know, meant to build Blade of the Rune King and Kraken Slayer. Right, so um, would like to see follow-up changes, um, you know, some mid-scope work that um, gets Viego off of Divine Sunderer. I don't know how you do it, because obviously he has such good Sheen Synergy with his low cooldown Q and high auto-attack range. It's a tough one to solve, but I personally really want to see it happen. As someone who casts a lot of Viego, I feel bad that he is building Bruiser, and that is optimal for him. 
Um, anyway, meaningful nerf though. Next up is Wukong. Wukong is losing 1.5 uh, base health per five. Wukong has a passive where he heals 0.5% of his base uh, of his max health every five seconds as well. Um, so he gets max health as regen. And as he, as he gets in combat with enemy champions, he gains substantially more regen as well as substantially more armor. Um, and so let's take a look at what this passive does. Um, so uh, this is Wukong's health per minute before and after. Um, worth noting that this is actually a fairly low health per minute. So uh, one design tenet that is actually very important, especially for League of Legends, but I think um, is true for any game, um, is you, unless this is like an intentional choice, um, you never want to say my strength is a lie, right? If you are playing Scion or Cho'Gath and you see, hey, when I feast something, I gain max health. And when I'm Scion and I kill minions, I gain max health. You don't want the strength, I have the highest health in the game, to be a lie. Now, Cho'Gath and Scion have low base health. Like, their their base health, their health growth, just from leveling up, are in fact quite low. Scion is exceptionally low. Um, but that's okay, because the W passive is strong enough that that strength is not a lie. He, in fact, has the most health in the game, functionally. Because unless you really, really can't CS anything, yeah, you're going to have a lot of health. Um and and so the tooltip gets to look bigger and feel more compelling, and players can be like, "Oh my god, fifteen hundred health from my W pass of this game!" Like that feels cool, right? When Shogath feast, you're like, "Oh, I have ten stacks. I have like six hundred extra health." Like reading tooltips is nice. Um, when tooltips get to look big, that is awesome. Um, just big numbers wise, not paragraphs. You know, we're not we're not playing Jin passive here. Um, like that is a good thing. Um, so my strength shouldn't be a lie, but I want big tooltips. So how do you balance that? Well, um, you have to find the right you, you have to find the right balance, really. Um, which is, hey, by the way, um, don't worry about it. Once you hit enough targets, and you know, multiply this by sixty, um, you know, we could even just um, right, like, okay, cool. If I max stack my passive, I have two hundred and forty-two health per minute. Yeah, it's way higher than every champion in the game. It's not even close, right? So it's like, oh, okay. Like, okay, eighty became sixty-two. Sixty-two is actually on the very, very low end, but like. If you stack your passive, you in fact have the highest health regen of the game. Oh, okay, it's not a lie. Um, but what I'm doing here is um, basically so. Okay, if I'm if I'm in a low state where nothing, literally nothing's happening, I actually have very very low health regen. It scales up because as your base health scales up, your regen scales up quite a bit. And yeah, he's indeed got very high health regen at, in late game because of how much his health growth is. Um, but um, I really wanted to call out um, how actually low his in combat health regen is um, because it feels like that's like oh yeah yeah I ten stack my passive, I get a bunch of bonus armor. Can I just drain tank people? No. So, right, you, you max stack your passive at level 18, and it's 15 health per second. That's not a lot, right? Like, if, if, if okay, if you're going to live for 10 full seconds in a team fight, which is not unreasonable, you have decoy, you have, like, 2 and, like, 2.4, like, full seconds of knockups on the entire team, like, you are going to live for quite a while. Um, But, you know, you live for 10 seconds in a team fight, and it's... A ruby crystal? Like, it's not that much, right? It's not that much regen. Now, again, he's not Dr. Mundo, but, like, you know, max stack level 18 passive is still not really that much life gain. Like, it's not the kind of thing where you're like, oh, boy, I'm sure glad we're, like, we bought the Grievous Wind because he healed so much in the team fight. Like, it's less than literally any champion's self-shield, right? Um, you know, Aerie is practically this much over the course of a full team fight. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not a lot, um, just kind of worth noting, which means that this is actually more placed as like, ah, I am more of the trickster, right? It's, and it's why the region lasts for kind of a while. It's why the stack, like the passive stacks last for kind of a while. It's like, well, no, I get in and do like my three auto attack, you know, three spell trade. And then I hop out and I got six stacks of my passive and I can use that to like, you know, recover over the course of the fight, right? Because, hey, if this is going on for five or seven seconds, like, oh, well, that's like, you know, 50, 70 health. You know, that's actually not that bad. Um, so, okay, just by the way, right, there's there's some of the numbers. So the strength is not a lie, uh, but do not think that, you know, even before the nerf or after the nerf or whatever, um, that Wukong actually has extreme in combat regen because it's just not true. Um, it's, it's just not that much. It, it somewhat adds up, but it's still not that much. Uh, this is a very big buff, I think. Um, this is pretty meaningful. I actually still think Zaya is is somewhat fine. Uh, Zaya does have a very poor win rate, um, but I think Zaya is a, a quite situational champion. Um, her binding with Rakan, by the way, is not that high. Um, so uh, both Zaya and Rakan um, have each other as their highest pick rate lane mate, um, but their their like synergy difference um, isn't actually really positive. So, like if you look at the win rate of Zaya, 
in the event of Rakan, in the event of Zion and Rakan in the lane together, it's just the average of their two individual win rates. And and before you're like, wait a second, you're biased. It's like, only like 30% of Zaya's and Rakan's games are with each other. So like 70% of the games are without each other, which means, um, you know, most of this win rate is still without each other, only 30% with each other. Yeah, sure, the differences are kind of squashed because 30% is a pretty high duo rate. Um, but at the end of the day, you come here and here and it just ends there. There's no win rate shift because of the pairing. There's actually none. There's literally zero win rate shift for pairing. So they are they are a neutral pairing for one another. Um, so the idea that like Zaya and Rakan are amazing together is is not founded. Uh, if you want to try to make the argument that like, ah, but Zaya Rakan synergy is locked behind being really good at playing Zaya Rakan, there is some argument for that. But to to make up the fact that every other champion and even these champions have a positive win rate duo, Yeah, Zaya Rakan are really not that tied together. Um, that the the nerfs that had come in, um, in terms of how much extra damage on the W and and how much E dash range there was and whatnot, like that got nerfed enough to where it is actually a flat duo. It is it is a flat duo, by the way. Um, they do work well together. You are not wrong to pick them together, uh, but it is not specifically obviously advantageous. Um, anyway. 20 to 30 seconds off her R cooldown is pretty meaningful. I will say 160 feels like an eternity in the early game. Um, with Essence Reaver being nerfed as heavily as it was um, a year or so ago, uh, actually more like four months ago or something, um, you really can't stomach going Essence Reaver first item on Zaya anymore, uh, so she can't really get early haste. It feels pretty rough. Um, this is a pretty meaningful buff, even though percentage-wise um, it's only 12%, whereas late game it is 23%, you know, fully double the, the percentage uh, win rate difference, or uh, cooldown difference uh but you will still feel this um you will definitely also feel that just again you know hot at 30 with an s3 for the build uh likely as a second or maybe a fourth item um is you know going to make this less necessary uh you're never gonna get it twice in a fight for example it's so like you know whatever but i mean there are going to be some cases where like oh we got fought again like, got away from talon but then we had to, like defend the mid and him and then not ulted me but it came back in time it's okay um but I mean, this is this is pretty meaningful. Like this is this is certainly her biggest weakness. Um, we are in a very melee heavy, dive heavy metagame. Um, this is, I think, a very good Zaya metagame. I think she is um, like situations are good in those kind of situations. Um, I think this is a good buff. I don't think she is generically going to be strong. I think she will probably still be generically somewhat weak. She will be sub fifty as her kind of average win rate. But um, as someone who actually really does like playing a lot of Zaya, I found a lot of success playing her um, in things like Clash, where um, you know my team had priority picks elsewhere. Like we really wanted to like get our jungle or support or whatever picked up early, um, and I was like, okay, well I'm picking on four or five, and oh, this feels like a Zaya game, and I'm happy to lock it in. I usually do pretty well. Um, so you know, I think she really did have her situations. Um, if you can get to the point where you're kind of picking her because of the ult being really the only untargeted ability that exists on Marksman, it's like it's the only way you can become unt untargetable to Nocturne on a Marksman um, without having, you know, Tom Kench in your team. It's the only way you can um, dodge Tom Kench ult without having Black Shield, not Tom Kench, um, Nautilus ult, because uh, Samir W doesn't work. Um, Ezreal, you'll still take the stun. Um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, she has some pretty cool stuff here that's actually pretty valuable. So, you know, I think again, she has some pretty good situational use uh, utility here. Um, I guess Sivir can spell shield it for what it's worth. But um, anyway, pretty good stuff. Uh, next up is Holebreaker. Um, and Holebreaker is getting um, 0 to 15 bonus armor and MR. Uh, so I just picked a random champion like York and said, what if York's using it? So, of course, uh, you're really going to buy it before level 9. So we're just choosing level 9 as the first start point. Uh, but level 9 stats are identical. So here you go. Um, you know. 20 more armor and MR is still 20 more armor and MR, and then it scales up linearly from here. Um, it means more in the magic damage case because Yorick, like all champions, has less MR than armor in the late game, um, and even in the early game because he has 39 base armor. Um, but okay, yeah, it turns out, you know, 15 more armor when you have 150 isn't as meaningful as 15 more MR when you only have 98. Um, still a pretty good amount, still pretty good durability increase. Of course, the um, this is triple effective on your minions, also quite meaningful. This matters a lot more, by the way, because a lane minion doesn't have any armor MR. So, um, you know, going from 60 armor, uh, or sorry, going from 130 armor to 180 armor is a lot more meaningful. Um, so you are going to buff these things by quite a bit. They're going to be much, much more durable. Um, it doesn't seem to be there. I'm sorry, there's no pirate hat, as far as I can tell. That's too bad. I know it's the buff everyone wanted, but um, this is definitely meaningful. Um, and I think Holebreaker is a pretty solid playstyle. Um, 
my understanding, uh, I do not have the data myself. I didn't look for it, uh, but it seems to be uh, the opinion uh, based on data that Riot has that there are going to be some champions where Holebreaker first is their optimal first item. I don't know what those champions are, but they seem to exist, that there's a good handful of champions where Holebreaker is the optimal first or second item, and you should be trying to play into that play style and go hard split push, and I really do think this is somewhat underused and good overall. Um, should have some stuff here. Um, all right, Spellbook stuff, split ranked, uh, ranked split threes coming in, and we managed to go for about an hour despite me saying it was going to be a short one. I went on some rants. Sucks to be me. I'm trash. League of Legends patch 11.15 rundown TLDR. Let's do it. A um, bunch of nerfs for a bunch of different things. A bunch of buffs as well. Cool beans. Ukshun's coming out. That looks pretty sick. Annie, very, very, very small nerf to her Q. This shouldn't mean very much. Annie will still be a very powerful mid laner and absolutely worth playing. This isn't going to be a very big deal. Uh, Star Surge getting one second cooldown is not a big deal either. The optimal skill order for Aurelian Soul is to max E second, meaning you're not getting 7 becomes 8, you're getting 11 becomes 12 for most of the game, and that just isn't that meaningful. E max second on Aurelian Soul. Enjoy your win rate. This champion is still going to be absolutely absurd. Very, very strong champion. Next up is Blitzcrank getting 3 armor and 21 damage on Rocket Grab. Um, that's not bad. That should be a pretty meaningful buff. Blitzcrank should be in a decent spot. Definitely worth playing. Going to be on the strong side. Caitlyn getting a 0 to 20% total AD ratio, which is actually quite meaningful. Um, this is an upwards of 10% more damage at pretty much all late game points in time. Um, on a somewhat primary damage ability, this definitely should be felt. Is a pretty meaningful buff to Caitlyn. Um, she is a bit below um, normal win rate. Like, she is objectively kind of underpowered right now. So a, a moderate size buff seems appropriate. This should feel really good. Caitlyn should be on the strong side for sure. Cassie be getting 10 flat damage on her E whenever the enemy is poisoned. This, of course, can help last hitting. You get the mana back when you do so, so that's not a problem here. Um, but it also really, really helps her early lane trading. This should do a lot to push her toward the pro meta. I think Cassipia should be a strong mid laner and a good mid laner for pro. So I'm expecting, I, I, if you want to play some games of Cassipia mid, you will be rewarded. And I expect to see some Cassipia in pro um, before the end of playoffs. Next up, Gwen getting an early game attack speed nerf of 20%, tapering down to none at level 13 of the champion. Uh, this should be felt quite a bit. This will uh, do a, quite a bit to, uh, you know, push down her early landing power. Um, it, it continues the idea that she is weak into melee fighters who want to fight her back. Champions like Riven and Jax are the obvious spot checks of champs who are good into Gwen and should be played. Next up is Aurelia getting mostly late game focused nerfs. The W early game damage isn't that high anyway, but it is an AD ratio uh, nerf. This is a total AD ratio, by the way, so this does affect the base damage of the ability, but it is when you max second, so eventually the base points, the base ranks, and the ability will take over the damage somewhat. Uh, but as she builds more AD, this will... Um, you know, continue to be a bigger and bigger nerf. Um, and the damage reduction in the late game is actually pretty substantially nerfed. Um, taking 20% damage to taking 30% damage is a 50% damage taken increase. That can be really meaningful. Um, late game uh, durability and, you know, kind of all game damage nerfs to a W is definitely there. That's going to be felt. Okay. KL losing 4 MR is about a 3% durability cut against mages. Should nerf for a mid game somewhat, but KL will still be high win rate and still worth playing. 10 to 30 extra damage on Ken and Q and a 0.05 higher AP ratio is pretty meaningful. Um, this is a pretty big deal, but Ken and Q is quite fair, so I don't think he's going to be overbearing, but a solid buff. Cool to see this um, should be a relatively viable champion. Mordekaiser, two seconds off his W. He maxes last, so uh, 14 becomes 12 for most of the game. Uh, but this is really, really good. Um, this allows it to be uh, much more actively in the trading pattern, especially with this storing a lot more damage. Um, and storing the shield, you can much more aggressively use the shield to trade and just, you know, go for the walk-up Qs and, and battle back against melee champions. Um, this should feel really, really, really good. Um, I expect this to be a pretty meaningful buff to Mordekaiser, and he should be in a quite good spot. Um, didn't really have problems with health in his clear, so this is not going to hurt. It's not going to really matter here too much. Um, he's going to be a bit healthier in the clear, but it's not that big of a deal. Speaking of health, Nidalee is getting... Uh, 25 to like 2,000 something more health. This is a really, really, really big deal. Um, or 2,200 something more health. Um, this is a really, really big deal. Percentage-wise, this means more in the late game. Uh, but this is a definitely meaningful buff to Nidalee's durability. This is going to be several win rates, uh, several percentage points of win rate. Probably expect to see some pro play from Nidalee as a result of this one. Um, I'm going to say I expect to see more Lilia, and we didn't. Um, I still think Lilia is quite good. 
Um, but I think Nidalee can definitely show up behind Diana as a strong AP jungle choice, and we probably see her picked up somewhat as a result. Two seconds off Rel W cooldown is really meaningful. Um, Rel needs to get back and forth on her W kind of constantly. She actually kind of wants to press on cooldown in some cases because she gets the, sh the shield for going into um, into slow form, but she wants to get back at a horsey form for the knockback or the fling. Like, she really kind of wants to frequently cycle. Um, this is actually a pretty big deal. Uh, pretty meaningful buff for sure. Uh, Rumble is mostly scripting updates. Uh, the big nerf being that you can't uh, basically double cast when you're near 100 heat. Um, that's the big one here. And yeah, it's otherwise just mostly scripting update, which shouldn't mean too much overall. Um, Shivana gets two seconds off her Q cooldown, which is the ability that even on AD and AP Shivana, you're going to max last. So first three levels of the game, just a flat two seconds off and then up to level 18, still going to be a buff. 50% um, higher AP ratios overall uh, because uh, total of 0.4 because the total of 0.6 uh, is really, really meaningful. Um, AP Shivana is a bit more likely to get into melee range and actually auto attack people, which kind of fleshes her out as a champion a bit more. Um, worth noting that despite the pick rate difference being so stark that people think they can only play AP Shiv, Bruiser Shiv is still the stronger of the two builds, is a good champion, is worth playing. AP Shiv a bit more worth playing now as well. Uh, Silas gets 10 flat damage and 0.1 flat AP ratio increased on, uh, Q, on the back half of Q, the difficult part of Q to hit. Um... As uh, a bigger nerf, though, Kingslayer is down pretty substantially uh, to the tune of 1 6th, the ratio being down by 1 9th. Uh, pretty meaningful. This is definitely going to matter. This should be a nerf overall, and it's part of Riot uh, kind of pushing down and healing somewhat in the game. Uh, Syndra getting 20 mana cost off her early rank Q. Of course, you max it first, so pretty quickly it's not going to be a big deal anymore. Uh, but pretty meaningful. This is going to be a lot for her early landing priority. Um, this should honestly probably put Syndra right back in pro play. Uh, next up is, is Thresh, getting uh, 2 to 1 seconds increased cooldown on the E. I really think this could have been 13 to 9 and, you know, do away with the decimals here. Um, to, like, even further incentive uh, putting points in E, because right now maxing E is his least popular option. Uh, first or second, by the way. Uh, maxing E last seems to be the highest roommate option, so I think you could have really kept um, the idea of going into E uh, here as the designer, but it's kind of whatever. Um, either way... Uh, you know, two seconds on an ability is meaningful. It's going to nerf Thresh, absolutely. You know, less trading powder. It's going to be up less often for, you know, swatting away hooks and whatnot and, and Leonas and things like this. So, um, you know, not not a, you know, it is a good nerf. This is well targeted. Um, this does somewhat increase the likeness of ranking up the E because you are getting three seconds off the cooldown instead of two seconds off the cooldown for maxing it. Um, again, I think you could have gone with four, whatever. It's not a huge deal. Um but yeah, um, you know, so many for Thresh as he is the most dominant uh, pro support, but we probably still see him picked almost all the time. Uh, Vigo getting a PvP and uh, minion wave clear focus nerf. Uh, keep in mind Q has a 60% total AD ratio on top, so it's not actually doing 15 damage. It's doing, you know, 45 or 55 damage, uh, but the monster damage is the same. Uh, the healing against minions is cut really severely, uh, but technically, in, in absolute terms, it is less nerf than it was two patches ago uh, when it was cut from 150%. Uh, it's now only cut by 40% instead of cut by 50%. Uh, but either way, um, this, this should actually do quite a bit to push Viego all over the rest of the way out of lanes. Right now in pro, he is mostly a jungler, but this will probably get him the rest of the way out of the lanes. Um, the lower, I mean, he'll still be somewhat viable, but it's like a little bit weak. Um... And as a jungler, he will still objectively lose damage because this is this is still PvP damage. This is still wave clear in some cases where it matters. Um, and he'll still lose a little bit as a result of this nerf. Uh, but jungle Viego is fine. Uh, Wukong losing some health regen. Um, end of the day, if he's never in PvP combat, this really is a very low amount of health regen. But if he stacks a passive at all, he's still got one of the best regions in the game. So not a big problem there. Um, Zaya getting 20 to 30 seconds taken off her R cooldown is going to be pretty meaningful. Um, she's probably still going to end up in a slightly weak spot overall. She's pretty bad in terms of win rate, but I still really believe in Zaya as a situational pick, um, who is who is good into die for comps, which is a meta game that we are in, um, and thus I think uh, deserves to be played uh, to decent effect in several games. Uh, Holebreaker getting zero to fifteen extra armor MR by the end of the game. Um, if you rush at first item, you won't feel it at level 9, but um, certainly if you just, you know, get a few levels or you wait to buy it second, you're going to feel some extra durability to the tune of, like, maybe 8%, um, and that's not bad. Um, it's gonna, you're going to feel it a little bit. And that's the TLDR on the patch rundown. Thanks everyone for tuning in, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.